morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow. I'm on a speaker. It's great to be here this morning to, uh, to talk to you today about this little section in uh, God's Word, uh, Genesis chapter 11. Uh, my name's Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at New King. If I haven't met you yet, please take a moment at the end of the service and say hello. I'd love to meet you. Um, this particular chapter um, ends a section in, uh, in Genesis. And what I want to do for you this morning is I want to give you a short overview of Genesis 1 through 11 so we can see some progression in how things happen. And then uh, after that, I want to get into these nine verses, give you an exposition about what they mean, and then in the end, uh, share with you some conclusions. And I trust the Lord will, will teach you from from Genesis 11 as he's taught me. So uh, let's pray together uh, and then we'll jump right in. Father God, I pray that you would help me this morning, that your Holy Spirit would guide me and empower me to preach your word and to be faithful to it. Father, I pray for those that are here this morning, that they would hear not me, but they would hear your word, that you would make it uh, something that's understandable to their heart, that they would change their lives. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, Genesis 1 through 11. I know some of you are disappointed that we didn't take up certain sections. Uh, we only did one sermon on uh, Noah and the flood. Could probably do three or four on those, but you know, we don't, I want to, I want to live to see the end of our <laughs> preaching in Genesis, and you know, at my age, I'm, you know, I'm on the edge, you know, and I'm, I'm looking down at the abyss, so I, we got to go quick, but, but listen, it's really interesting, scholars all agree that Genesis 1 through 11 form the primeval history. It's called primeval history, the beginnings of things. And then when you get into chapter 12, you have the beginning of the patriarchs, the patriarchal history. You have Abraham, you have Isaac, you have Jacob, and you have Joseph and all that. And then Genesis finally comes to a close in chapter 50. So you have the primeval history, 1 through 11, and then the patriarchal history that begins in 12. So that's how it's broken up. And remember chapter 1. God created the cosmos by his powerful word. Do you remember that sermon? Some guy that looked a lot like me. Priest, and you've all forgotten. God, by his powerful word, created and called into being the cosmos. And he invested it with form and function and purpose. And it was very good. You remember that. That's chapter 1. And then chapter 2, it kind of goes back. All of a sudden, it kind of goes back. And it focuses on the highlight of chapter 1, which is the creation of man and woman in the image of God. And if you remember, he gave them purpose. You are to go out throughout the earth. You are to, you're, you're to procreate. You are to have children. And you are to cover the earth. That was their call, to go out and do that. You remember that? And then everything fell apart in chapter 3, didn't it? And, and, and what God was doing in 1 and 2, he was setting up purpose. He was setting up function. He was setting up boundaries. You have to understand that. that he was setting up boundaries. And now in chapter 3, the boundaries are crossed. Don't eat from that particular tree. And of course they do. They cross that boundary, right? And terrible things happen. And they're driven out from the garden. And there's curses pronounced. And in chapter 4, it gets even worse. They have children. They do what God commands them to do. 
Adam and Eve, they have children, and Cain kills Abel. He gets angry, and he gets mad, and there's violence, and his blood cries out from the earth. And then what happens? We didn't talk about this one, really, but the violence increases. This guy Lamech shows up. And he's an extremely violent man. Seven times 70. And then it's interesting. You may not have noticed this, but when you read chapter 4 towards the end, it says Lamech took two wives. And we, and we just glance over that and say, oh yeah, that's the Old Testament. They always had a whole bunch of wives. It's significant. He had an appetite. A sexual appetite that couldn't be satisfied. And now he's got two wives. And the problems begin there. And then uh, chapter 5 is, is a bit of a, of a history, the generations of Noah. And then chapter 6, if you know chapter 6 at all, the very beginning, we have this insanely weird section where the sons of God see the daughters of men and they take wives of them and there's men of renown, giants in the land and it's like what is going on here? There's a boundary that's being crossed. A marriage boundary. Yeah? can't tell you any more about that now because I'll go the whole time. It's a fascinating section. And then, of course, God looks down right after that and he sees that, man, everything he does is evil and wicked from the time he's born. And God says, I gotta, I gotta do something. And the flood comes. And we see God's grace all through Genesis. We see God's grace, his care for people, and he saves Noah and his family through it. And then what happens after the flood? Noah is sent out with the same command that was made to Adam and Eve. Go out into the world. Yeah? Don't stay in one place. Go out into the world, populate it, multiply, go out and do that. Right? And then that's, you know, chapter, chapter 9, it says it twice in there. So go out and do that. And then chapter 10 is a fascinating chapter that nearly everybody skips over. It's called the Table of Nations. Seventy nations are named. And they come from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And there's lots of interesting things in there, but we, we can't go through it. So we have the Table of Nations. The main point is... People are spreading out. They have a language. They have a, 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 a culture. They have a clan. They have a nation. And they're spreading out. Right? It says it three times. For each son, it says it. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their nations, or their languages, their lands, their nations. These are the, these are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands and their nations. It says it three times. They're spreading out. And then you come to chapter 11, verse 1. The whole earth had one language and the same words. What's going on? I thought they were all spreading out with different languages. What's happening in 11 is the writer of Genesis is going back to a time before they all spread out. He's going back, and he's going to tell you why they spread out and why that's important. So he's kind of going back to do that. So chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis, we see boundaries being crossed again and again and again. Man corrupts everything. He corrupts marriage. He corrupts family. There's violence. There's sexual corruption going on. One thing after another until God says, you're totally corrupt. I'm going to send a flood and destroy you all. But there's one thing that's not corrupted yet. 
And Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, shows us what that is. What could be left? What is untouched by the greasy, slimy, dirty hand of man? What could it be? Let's go through the chapter, or the section, nine verses. Let's talk through it, and uh, I'll show you. So the first four verses are man's plans. Verses 5 through 9 are God's response. Man's plans, construction. We will build. God's response, deconstruction. No, you won't. Yeah? Very simple. So, verse 1. The whole earth had one language and the same words. It's obviously going back before the table of nations in chapter 10. It's something that happens a lot in Genesis. You have a summary, and then you go back. Same thing happened. You, you, maybe you wonder, why does it go in Genesis 2, go back to Adam and Eve and talk about that? That's the main point. So summary, and then go back. Chapter 11. Chapter 10, summary. Chapter 11, then we're going to go back. Very common. Don't be nervous about that. That's how the author did things. Once you recognize it, it's like, oh yeah, I see that now. Same language, same vocabulary. Verse 2, And as people migrated from the east, or towards the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. The east, when you head east, it's not a good thing in the Old Testament, particularly in Genesis. Adam and Eve were thrown out of a garden and they were thrown out on the east side because there was an angel that was put there with a sword to say you can't come in. So they headed east. After Cain killed his brother, he went east of Eden to the land of Nod. East. Later, we see that Lot, further east, further east, further east, closer and closer to Sodom and Gomorrah, it's a disaster. So, in Genesis, heading east has connotations of being bad. So they migrated. They settled in a, a plain in the land of Shinar. They settled there. And Shinar is, uh, is mentioned back in chapter 10. That's where this guy Nimrod was. If you look back at chapter 10, there's a lot of focus on this guy Nimrod, a mighty hunter. I don't think that's a great name. Nobody calls their kid today Nimrod unless it's like you Nimrod, right? You dumbhead, you Nimrod. But he was a mighty hunter. He was, a, he was actually a tyrant. He was a vicious man. And it says uh, uh, in verse uh, 9, he was a mighty hunter. Uh, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Okay, there's a connection. Eric, you didn't think my name was in the Bible. There it is. They spelled it wrong. Uh, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria. He built Nineveh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a focus on this guy because later we know that there were two countries that attacked the nation of Israel. Assyria attacked the ten nations, the northern tribes, and destroyed it hundreds of years later. Babylon did the second Nimrod was the common threat. And he settled in Shinar. So where were they headed? They were headed to Shinar. Anybody that reads this is going to say, ah, they're headed east, they're going to Shinar. This is not going to end well. This is not good. Verse 3. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for, for mortar. Ah, we have new technology. In that area, there's not a lot of stone. We've got to build. Man, we are people. We're created in God's image. We have creativity. We're resourceful. Let's build using something new, new technology. We're going to use this this. Uh, uh, Butamin, which is tar. We're going to use that for mortar. And um, we're going to use brick, kiln-fired brick. New technology. We can't build. There's no stone. We'll come up with something. Simple as that. New technology. And then we come to verse 4. Verse 4 is where the problem is. 
And actually, there's three things that are named that are problematic. Verse 4, they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city. Problem number one. And a tower with the top in the heavens. Problem number two. And let us make a name for ourselves. Problem number three. Lest we be dispersed across the face of the earth. Problem number one. Build a city lest we be dispersed. Problem number two. Build a tower into the heavens. Problem number three. Make a name for ourselves. What's wrong with those three? Why are they problems? I'm going to come back to that at the end. Just keep that in mind. Build a city, build a tower, make a name. All three problems. And we see now God's response. We have construction, and now we have God's response beginning in verse 5, the deconstruction. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. Now you have to understand what the writer of Genesis, Moses, is doing here. This, the words that he's using, the description that he's using is satire or parody. He's making fun of them. And you're like, come on, how do you get that? The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had made. Now, these guys wanted to build a tower all the way to the heaven, and they were well on their way. And God says, you know, I've got to come all the way down. And he says, children of men is children of dirt, really, is what he's saying. God in his throne of heaven, they think they're reaching to heaven. God says, yeah. I'm going to come down and see what the children of dirt have made. So it's parody. It's satire. He's making fun of them. They wanted a celestial work, but the writer says it's only terrestrial. It doesn't reach very far. They think they're going to heaven. No, God's got to come down, and he looks to see what the children of dirt have built. Then verse 6. Uh, and the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. This is only the beginning, God says. The potential for boundary crossing is unlimited. The corrupted human spirit will stop at nothing, and God sees it, and God knows it. Yeah, do you see that? He's saying, like, this is going to be out of control here. And verse 7. Come, let us go down. Notice again what God does. He borrows their language. Come, let's build a city. Come, let's build a tower. Come, let's do that. It shows purposeful resolve. We're going to do this, God says. Yeah, you think you are? I'm going to do this. Come, he says. Uses the same language. Let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. their fundamental way of communication. And he says, I'm going to stop it right there. So the Lord dispersed them from there, verse 8, over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Lack of a common language leads to lack of common understanding and purpose. They cannot work together anymore, and the project 
is terminated. Nothing new there. And then uh, they were dispersed. The one thing that they were afraid of we don't want to be dispersed lest we be dispersed. The one thing they didn't want, God says, yeah, you're going to go out. I'm going to have my way. <laughs> you're going to be dispersed because that's what I want for you. I want you to go out, right? And they're dispersed over the face of the earth. So, what did the original Old Testament hearers think when they first read Genesis? What did they take away from it? It's always good to go back and look at the historical setting and to think, well, what lesson did they get from it? Well, uh, they would see that it's written as a satire against the claims of Babylon, which was the center of civilization. And uh, if they were going into the promised land when this was written, when Moses wrote this, uh, it, it describes the cities. If you look in the book of Numbers and the, look, and the book of Deuteronomy, it describes the people that go into the promised land as they saw cities that reached to heaven. And this would have been an encouragement to them. They would have said, oh my word, we're going up against these huge buildings, they reach to heaven, look at the Tower of Babel, God can bring us into the promised land. He's powerful and he can have his way there. If it was later, during the exile, when the Israelites were in Babylon, same thing. If they had read it then, it would have been tremendous encouragement that Babylon was going to be toppled. So the original Readers would have had tremendous encouragement from this story. So now, I want to get back to those three problems I mentioned. The first problem was uh, they were going to build a city, and I said, that's an issue. That's a problem. Why? Genesis 1.28 says, since you are created in God's image, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion. As God's vice regents, as God's representatives, the people were to go out from the Garden of Eden, and they were authorized to spread the kingdom. Eden was going to be spread step by step, place by place until God's kingdom filled the whole earth and they were given the responsibility to do that that was repeated after the flood just so you don't miss it twice after the flood go out, fill the earth, subdue it the problem the people at the tower the people building the city were disobedient to the clear word of God they were created with purpose, and they said, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. We don't want to be dispersed all on the earth. We're going to build a city. So building a city was a statement and an act of disobedience to God's word. When you're disobedient to God's word, things progress. That's a starting point, yeah? Yeah? That's the starting point. Remember in the garden, the serpent says to Eve, has God really said, you question God's word, you don't obey God's word, and what's the next step? You build a tower. Why is that a problem? In this area of Mesopotamia, about 25 of these towers have been found. They all have exactly the same characteristics. They're in different spots. They're in different places. But they all look about the same. You can go on the internets. You've heard of the internets. All the kids are talking, I guess, about the internets. I don't know. And, and you, can, you can look them up. They're called a ziggurat. A ziggurat. And the characteristic of these 
is that they were these large structures that were solid. There was no rooms in them. They were solid. And they went up high, and they had a staircase. A staircase. That was their only feature. A staircase. Massive, lofty, made of solid brick. Just like this. You can see pictures of them on the internet today. And uh, what were they used for? What was their primary function? Well, we know because of the names that were given to these ziggurats, to these towers. There's one that's in a, a city called Larsa, which is over in Mesopotamia. And the name of that one, get this, the house of the link between heaven and earth. There's one at Sippar. It's called the temple of the stairway to the pure heaven. And the one at Babylon, which you can see a picture of today, which was called the house with the foundation of heaven and earth. Babylon itself means gate of God. So what was the function of these ziggurats? It formed a link between heaven and earth. It was a portal. And the people of that day believed that if they made this tower with a staircase, that the gods would come down the staircase, and there was usually a temple below, and the god would take up residence in the temple. That's exactly what the Tower of Babel was. We're going we're gonna to build a tower using our new technology. We are going to cross the boundary between earth and heaven. A boundary that's set up in Genesis chapter 1. Why? Some people say that it was a stairway to heaven. There was a song way back when. I don't know if you've ever heard it. They thought that what man was trying to do was to go up to heaven, as the song goes, to buy their way to heaven. And that there may be some truth in that, but the ziggurats of the area of the time were actually the opposite. They wanted God to come down from heaven. They wanted God to come down from heaven so they could control God. See, the gods in that day were, were very unpredictable. And there were all kinds of them, gods of the weather, gods of, the, of, the, of, of farming. And, and if they could offer sacrifices and control the god, have the god under their thumb, if they could make a stairway from heaven to earth and get the god down there, they could now define the god and control the god. The sin of the tower was no different than the sin that we do today. We want to bring God down to our level. We want to control him. We want to put him in a box so that he does what we want him to do. You get that? So in the first 10 chapters of Genesis, we see man corrupting, himself and the boundaries are crossed one after the other until there's nothing left to corrupt except one thing and the reason that this section ends with the Tower of Babel because now they're doing the absolute worst thing they're not just corrupting themselves they're corrupting God himself they're defiling him they're defining him they're trying to control him we'll build a tower to heaven so that he can come down and he can be our God in a little box, a genie in a bottle. That's the problem with building a tower. And the last, you disobey God. You then, you then bring him down to your level. 
You define them in your terms. Look, how many times have you heard people say, I'm not going to believe in a God that's like that. The God I believe in would never let anybody die. The God that I, and all of a sudden, you're bringing God down to your level. You're defining him. You're defiling him. You're offending him. We can't put God in a box. So then what happens, right? Then what happens? We want to make a name. <laughs> we disobey, we defile God, and now we want to make a name for ourselves. Do you see the progression? What's the problem with that? The children of Adam say, I want to make a name for myself. There's three problems. Number one, I want everybody to know my name. I want to be famous. Yeah? I want to be famous. Second problem, I want to be known. I want to be identified by my work. I want people to marvel at my work. I'm identified by the work that I do. I retired from 37 years of aerospace engineering in 2020. For 37 years, I had been Eric the engineer. And I worried that when I retired, I would lose my identity that all of a sudden I would be lost because I identified myself that way. Thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> I had a great career. I don't miss it for a second. I have an identity from God that I always had. And it wasn't Engineer Eric. It was Eric, the child of God. Yeah? So people want their identity from work. So they want, to be, they want to be famous. They want their identity. The other thing they want from work is they want to be remembered. They want a legacy. I want, I want my name to live forever. That's what it means to have this name. I want everybody to know my name. I want to be famous. I want everybody to marvel at my work. And I want a legacy. That's why we work often, isn't it? And now, next point I want to say is, and I've said it before, I'm just going to reinforce it. The sin you see, the things that happen, it's progressive. One leads to the other. You begin with questioning God's word. Nobody does that today, right? Nobody does that. Nobody does that, right? We begin with questioning God's word. And then disobedience comes in. And then frustration and anger and violence and more violence. And then we cross sexual boundaries, don't we? The role of man and women is corrupted. Marriage is corrupted. And then you read that little story about Noah after the ark, and something happened there where his son Ham, and we're not sure. Noah gets drunk, he's naked, and Ham sees him. You know that story? It's weird. We're not sure exactly what happened, but there was a sexual perversion there, most likely. It leads us right back to Eden where the enemy does his best to corrupt and ruin God's very good creation. He created them in his image. He created them male and female. And today we live in the most confused and disorderly place when it comes to sexuality and gender. I can't even begin to believe it. Last time I looked it up, Wikipedia had 60-odd genders that you could be. Why is it today that it's all about gender? Every time you look at the news, every time you look at your phone, it's that written in your face. There's a, uh, a fellow coming to Virgen's High School next week. 
He transitioned to be a female. He realized it was a huge mistake, and it was a disaster, and he was forced into it, and he wants to come and tell his story. The hate in my little town that is coming, they don't want him to speak. They don't want him to share the fact that this could be a mistake. They don't want any other opinion. Our society is filled with this. Burlington, Vermont is filled with this. This is what Romans 1 talks about. I'm just going to read a little portion from Romans 1. Sometimes you read Romans 1, and I, I used to always read it and say, when did this happen? What was, what was Paul referring to? And, and listen to this. Just hear these words. Verse 21 of Romans 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images representing mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This was back in the days of, of, of the Tower of Babel, I think. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And it goes on. Three times God says he gave them up in Romans chapter 1. Each time sexual immorality is named as one of the results. And we see that from Genesis 1 to 11. There it is. Dear Christian, in this day of chaos and disorder, stand firm on the word of God. He created them male and female. That's it. We have compassion for those that are struggling. If, somebody, if you are struggling with gender identity today, please come talk to one of us as pastors. We want to be a help to you. We care about you. We know that those struggles are real. So please understand, New King is a place you can come, and we will help you. Sin is progressive. And the towers that we build, you know, this story is all about work. It's really about work. We, we, we build a city, we build a tower, we make a name. It's about work. We're created to work. But we often today, we do it with wrong motives. It's all about our identity. It's all about our significance. It's all about our power, our prestige, our pride, our money. You and I as Christians get caught up in it, just like everybody else. We work to make a name for ourselves. We drive ourselves to work. We sacrifice our families and our children at the idol of work. We define ourselves with work. And if we're successful, listen to this. If we're successful, it goes right to our head and we become prideful and arrogant. And we don't rely upon God. We're self-sufficient. If we're failures at work, it goes right to our heart. And we're absolutely on the ground. We can't even believe it. We're, we're just absolutely shocked by it, and it ruins our lives. So if we make it the idol, either path can lead to disaster. There's a guy um, you may have heard of the greatest jazz saxophone player that ever lived was a man named John Coltrane. And he came out with an album in 1964. Who here was living in 1964 other than me? Okay, we've got a few. Coltrane, if you know anything about jazz music, he is one of the heavyweights. In 1964, Coltrane came out with an album called A Love Supreme. A Love Supreme. That was the name of it. And in the liner notes, Coltrane says this. Dear listener, 
All praise be to God, to whom all praise is due. Let us pursue him in the righteous path. Yes, it is true. Seek and ye shall find. Only through him can we know the most wonderful bequeathal. And then, and then Coltrane says, during the year 1957, that was before I was born, I experienced, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. At that time, in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privileges to make others happy through music. I feel this has been granted through his grace. All praise be to God. What happened to Coltrane? He found the Lord, and instead of creating music for himself, he created it for others. He created it for God. And that's when his career took off. And he wrote and performed some of the most amazing jazz music in the world. He got it. He saw that it's all about working for God and doing it for him. All praise be to God, Coltrane says. And we can do the same. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are created to do works that God prepared for us beforehand. We are God's workmanship created to do those works. We have to have the right perspective on work. It's not to make a name for ourselves. It's to make a name for God. We have it backwards. Okay, finally, oh boy, the curse of Babel has been reversed. When? How? The day of Pentecost. What happened? God himself came down in the person of the Holy Spirit, and he indwelled the people. And what did they do? They spoke in other languages, and people heard them giving glory to God. And 3,000 people were saved. It's the work of God coming down. The tower, the curse of it has been reversed. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I today, we go out and nothing can stop us. We have the power of God. All right, one last thing. I want to tell you one last thing. And this is precious to me. This is this idea of a name. Remember the three things I said about a name? I want to be famous. I want to live forever through my name. I want people to know my work. Let me show you what God does in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Frank, could you put up 217? Jesus, speaking here, says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. See, when you were at trial, if you got a black stone, it meant death. If you got a white stone, it meant life. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a white stone, and on that stone is a new name written. I am going to give you the name, and nobody else is going to know it. What does that tell you? It's intimacy. We're not going to have a name published far and right about us. We're going to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. He knows us inside out, and we're going to know him inside out. He says, I'm going to give you a name. No one else knows. A pet name. A name only between you and and I. That's our Savior Jesus. Uh, Frank, the next verse, 3 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. I will never, you see that? I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. What does that speak of? Immortality. I will never blot your name out of the book of life. You're going to live forever. You're immortal. You're going to be with me. And I'm going to confess your name to the Father daily. I died for this one. I gave my life for this one. He's mine. He belongs to me. I give him my new name. 
We have immortality. And the last one, 312, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Forget the Tower of Babel. He's going to be a pillar. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God. This is Jesus speaking. The name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. And my own new name. We're going to have three names written on us. We're going to have the stone that says life. Jesus is going to confess our name. It's going to be in the book of life. And then he says, I'm going I'm to give you, you want an identity? I'm going to give you three identities. I'm going to write the name of my God on you. I'm going to write the name of my city, New Jerusalem. And I'm going to give you my new name. What's his new name? See, because of the cross, because of Jesus' obedience, because what he did for you, because he suffered and died for you, God has given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, everyone should bow. Will you bow before Jesus? You want to go babble? Everything Jesus does is so much better come to Jesus. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this story so long ago. We thank you that we can read about all these things and see how pertinent they are to our lives. Help us, Father, to not make work an idol. Help us to be obedient to the word. Help us to not try to define you and, and put you in a box. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We pray that we would be more like him that we would see him as he really is. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.